Well, I ask you if you would to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 8. Luke chapter 2, begin in verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of God shone around them. They were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Let's bow. Father, we ask you today that as the shepherds were just absolutely enveloped in your glory, as they received the wonderful news that a Savior had been born, Lord, as they made haste to go and see as they beheld, Lord, as they made widely known what they had seen and heard, Lord, they returned back to the fields glorifying and praising you. Lord, may we be caught up in that same moment today as we consider your glory and your splendor. But more than anything, that Jesus Christ came to be born, to live and to die, that he might be a savior of the world. Father, help us to be as the shepherds were, that we would understand the good news of Jesus Christ, and we in turn would be willing to share with others. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Isn't it amazing how many times we've encountered in just these simple messages of Christmas, considering the different ones that, that uh, experienced that wonderful message. We had Mary, we had Joseph. Today we're looking at the shepherds. Uh, next Sunday, uh, we've got to talk about the baby. We've got to talk about Jesus. I mean, that's, that's right before Christmas. So we're going to consider the babe in the manger and the significance of what that meant and what that means today. But as we have come to these moments, it seems like every time when Gabriel appeared to Mary, when Joseph in a dream, uh, the angel came and told him to take Mary as his wife, the shepherds uh, as they are in the field by night and suddenly the, the angel appears uh, and, and they're startled when uh, Zacharias is praying and the angel appears to Zacharias to tell him about John the Baptist. He has to be told not to be afraid we just see it again and again and again. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And it just occurred to me that what is happening is that we're taking just our normal human lives and all of a sudden there's this brief moment where the veil is removed. That which is heavenly is made known to us. And in that moment, our little pea brain finite minds cannot grasp the glory and the beauty and the seriousness and the significance of that which is spiritual because we don't see it. We don't necessarily experience that day in and day out. When we read our Bibles, we see uh, definitely at the time of the first advent an increase in angelic activity. We see an increase, uh, I believe, in spiritual activity. I believe that that we see things and it's explained to us in the fullness of time as, as God led uh, uh, Joseph and Mary uh, to take the babe into another region for their protection. And we're given this insight of how God ordains and moves in the life 
of, of, of especially his, his own son, supernaturally. And it's the supernatural, I think, uh, that, that gives us a, a pause, possibly, of even having fear. <clears throat> we live today, uh, when we go through the book of Acts and we see the coming of the Holy Spirit, and we see the phenomenon of speaking in tongues and, and the uh, spreading of the gospel, and we see the incredible rapid spread of, of the good news of Christ that went throughout Jerusalem, Samaria, and then uh, literally to the uttermost parts of the world, <coughs> exactly as Jesus said it would. And we see the dynamic of the Holy Spirit at work. That is supernatural. Uh, here we are now, uh, all these years later, and folks, I'm telling you, the Lord works in supernatural ways today. He works in glorious ways today. Uh, when a lost sinner is convicted of their sin and they bring their cells and come to a place where they repent of their sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that that's the Holy Spirit at work. And we see a, an eternal damned soul come to know Christ that is suddenly made alive for all eternity. It is a beautiful, wonderful move of the Spirit of God. But we've lost the wonder. We've lost the glory, and unfortunately, we've lost much of the fear that comes with a supernatural reveal to us. I was thinking of the second advent of Jesus, and I don't do this very often, but I'm going to go on a tangent for just a minute, and I want us to consider the next time Jesus comes, because there's going to be a lot of activity around that. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, this world is going to recoil and is going to react, and it will be a fear that will be experienced because it's going to be a moment like nothing this world has ever seen. When we go to Revelation chapter 6, we see that John uh, is shown a scroll and, and no one in heaven is worthy to open it. And he begins to weep because no one's worthy. And then all of a sudden, the, the description is given of Jesus Christ. He looks like a lamb that was wounded and he comes and he takes the scroll and all of heaven erupts that he is worthy and a song breaks out of the worthiness of the Lord to open the scroll. But those scrolls as it open, there's seals that are peeled back each time and it's unfolding. Each of these seals uh, is causing a cataclysmic event on the earth. This is in our future. This is the beginning of the rumblings of the return and the second advent of Jesus Christ. The first seal is broken, and we see a world empire that comes from a leader who's going to win without a single shot being fired. He's going to be a great world leader the world is going to love him, and, uh, and he, he's just going to rise to an importance like we've never seen before. And that is going to be the beginning of the tribulation period uh, as this great leader uh, is brought about. The second seal and the third seal uh, refer to wars and then what comes after wars, pestilence and starvation and disease that this world will see, and it's going to affect the world. The fourth seal that is unrolled uh, in, in heaven uh, by Jesus, uh, we're going to see a time where uh, a quarter of the world's population is going to perish. It is going to be a cataclysmic time on this earth. The fifth seal, the fifth seal is going to recognize uh, a moment where this leader all of a sudden begins to put to death those who will not worship him and those who will not bow before him. And we're going to see uh, these martyrs in heaven waiting for the time that their deaths will be avenged. It is during this period and the sixth seal, there'll be a great cosmic disturbance that's going to take place on earth. The sun that we take for granted is going to be darkened. The moon will turn blood red, reflecting the distorted brightness of the sun. It's going to turn a blood red. The scriptures say the stars of heaven will literally fall. They'll be moved from what we've seen that has been the most steady thing that man has ever seen. Suddenly these stars will begin to move. There's going to be an earthquake, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 6, 
that's so drastic that every mountain and island on this planet will be moved from its normal place. It's in the midst of this that we read these world, these words in Rome in Revelation 6. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. The stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a wind. The sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. The kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man, hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, from the wrath of the Lamb. For the day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Quite a different message the second time, isn't it? Peace and goodwill and glad tidings to men. A Savior is born. All the earth can know this. But this is not going to be the second advent. It's going to be the time of the great day of the wrath of God. Then there's going to be a seventh seal. When the seventh seal is open, it begins the trumpet judgments. And we're going to see one judgment after another, after another, after another. A third of the uh, land, a third of, of all of the green grass and, the, and uh, the wilderness is going to be destroyed. A third of the population will be destroyed. Uh, there's going to be disturbances, and eventually there'll be a great war. After the seven trumpets in the Revelation, we see uh, the next sevens, which are the bold wrath judgments of God. And every one of these are literally wraths poured out on the earth. And it extends to the entire earth. The first bowl brings painful sores uh, on all the people. The second bowl, uh, uh, the sea that nothing living in it can live anymore. It's going to turn red. The third bowl will corrupt the springs and the water. They'll become his blood. The fourth bowl, wrath judgment, uh, will, will change the way uh, the heavens operate. We're going to see things uh, absolutely uh, uh, turned inside out as far as the sun. Uh, people will be scorched. There will be an incredible heat. The scriptures say the days will have to be shortened. The fifth bowl, uh, the earth will be plunged into darkness. Folks, it's just there. The sixth bowl, of course, is the one where there's going to be some type of an earthquake. The Euphrates will dry up, and of course that's going to make it possible for the armies of the east to enter into the, the Holy Land. All of this has been pre-told and predicted in Scripture. And folks, listen. Every single thing predicted and told of Jesus came to pass in his lifetime. Everything that was ever said of Jesus, uh, he fulfilled in his lifetime. Uh, uh, the, the very fact, folks, listen to me. The probability of one person fulfilling all the things that Jesus did is a number so astronomical that we cannot even comprehend it. And Jesus fulfilled all of them. Everything told of him has been fulfilled, and everything told of our future will be fulfilled. And I'm going to tell you something. When it happens, when it happens, it will create fear on this earth. It will be like, folks, I'll tell you what, we won't worry about. We won't worry about the price of ground meat or gas or booster shots or anything else. It's not going to matter. What's going to matter is that Jesus Christ is coming again. Am I prepared and am I ready? For if you are, I've got good news for you. And this is to me maybe a parallel of what the shepherds enjoyed. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul said, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. I cannot even begin to fathom what it's going to be like. Can you imagine? You know how somebody will shout to get your attention? Y'all know how that sounds. If You know, hey, or whatever it might be that you're trying to get somebody's attention. Uh, uh, mamas, you can shout better than anybody. Uh, there's a shrillness to your voice uh, that can pierce through. And look, that kid can be oblivious to the world 
until mama screams, and they'll hear every single time. But listen, there's going to be a shout. Some people say, well, what's it going to be? I have no idea what the shout's going to say. I don't think I can speculate, but it doesn't matter because I'm wrong. I don't know. But let me tell you what it will be. It is a shout to attention. It is a shout to get ready. It's a shout that something phenomenal is about to happen, and it will be followed by the trumpet of the Lord, a fanfare trumpet blown that will reverberate around this earth. Some people say, well, well this will be a secret that, that only Christians will hear it. I just do not believe that. I believe that it will be such that, that the entire world will recall in that moment. And folks, lest you say in your mind, I don't believe these things will happen. You just, you got to back up and watch the news right now. We're seeing so much, so much happening in the day in which we live today. Folks, when Jesus returns, there will be a great activity of spiritual uh, 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 movements. There'll be angelic movement. It'll be just like it was as far as, as the reaction as the first advent, except this one is going to involve the world. The shepherds were in the field, minding their business, doing what shepherds do, and I don't even know what shepherds do. <laughs> I guess uh, I always think of cowboys out in the field. So they, they've rounded up, or no, they don't round up, they follow, sheep follow. So they've got their sheep protected. Uh, they probably sat down and ate a piece of dry, dry crusty bread and a, maybe a hunk of cheese, a hoop cheese for you rednecks, but whatever it may be, uh, they're out there. But it's, 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 they're just out there living life is what they're doing. They're just out there living life. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden the Lord God in his wisdom. He, he didn't send his angels to rich people, the priests or the ones who are religious. The, the shepherds were lowly. When they say lowly shepherds, that just means they were not uh, well-liked. They stunk. They, they weren't as far as socially acceptable. They just weren't there. That's who the Lord chose to tell this beautiful news to. Now, folks, that gives me hope. Because we're nothing special. You may think you're special, but you're not. We're just normal sinners that needed a Savior. There's, there's nothing spectacular about any of us. And the Lord just loves us, just like we are. We don't have to impress Him. We don't have to have some air about us. We don't have to be a certain type of person. The Lord receives us as we are. And that night the angel stood before them. The Bible says the glory of God shone around about them. And let me just tell you something. That's what caused fear. The glory of God and the appearance of an angelic host. Folks, listen. Our minds are not equipped. If, if we could, if, if just for a moment, for just a millisecond, the veil could be pulled aside and we could see into the heavenlies. Even right now, the Bible teaches very clearly that it's all right here. Now, you may say, well, I don't, I don't believe. That's, you don't have to believe it. The Bible says it very clearly. If we could just glance, our immediate reaction would be the reaction of every single time in the Bible where it happened. We would fall on our faces, and we all of a sudden would recognize the holiness of God and the sinfulness that we possess. And it would be an immediate reaction. That's what would happen. That's what would happen. So the angels have to tell them, first of all, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Because I got something good to tell you. And the message was real simple. But it is a message that is good today. It is good that day. And it will be good in the last day. And it's just simply this. There is a Savior he is Christ the Lord. There is a Savior. He is Christ the Lord. Amen. Folks, that's all that matters when it boils down to anything pertaining to life. It's Jesus Christ, who He is to us. He is the Lord, and He is Messiah, and He is the Savior. But that doesn't mean He's your Lord. And your Savior, 
he comes to us and we respond to him. The angel said there's a sign, and it's very simple. You're going to find a baby. It's going to be wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. That's just a feeding trough. For some reason that I have no idea why, God chose to allow his only begotten to be born in a stinking barn. It doesn't make sense, does it? Not a palace, not a royal, uh, uh, you know, a king. The birth of a king's kid uh, should have been with all the royal trappings. And yet God chose. And I'm going to preach on that next week. But listen, that was the sign given. Just go. To, it's not even in the hotel, not even in the inn. There's a place where the animals are kept with all the smells and sounds and dirt and grime and germs. That's where you're going to find this King of kings and Lord of lords, the Messiah, the Savior. So, so here's their reaction, by the way. Oh, by the way, when that, when that news is given, and let me just say something. We only see angel activity so many times in Scripture, but every time it's given, it is really exciting. Now, we, it will cause us, if we're not careful, to become more interested in the angels and what they're doing. They're, they, we, we, we really can't do that. They were created. Uh, they have function. Uh, they're not human, uh, but they were created to worship God and to do His bidding. Uh, they're powerful. We know that. There's a lot of things in Scripture that is revealed about the angels. But what Gabriel said, I think, kind of sums it up as great as anything. He said, I am Gabriel, and I come from the presence of God. They're in the presence of the Lord. But the neat thing about the angels, and there's a few, there's a few moments in Scripture that are some of my favorites. This is one where the angel makes that great proclamation of, of the Savior that is born, a good news to all men, not select people, not just the Jews, to everybody, all of us. This is great news. And with that news, suddenly the angelic host, and by the way, when you read the Bible and you say, how many angels are there? It really describes an innumerable number. We don't, have, we don't know. We can't put a number to it. But it's thousands and thousands and ten thousands times ten thousands. So it's this huge, majestic number of created beings that worship the Lord and serve Him and do His bidding. And so we see that moment where the heavens erupt. And I have a vision of what it looks like, but I know, I, like you, Pat, like you woke up and you saw it. I kind of have a picture in my mind, but I can assure you it is nothing like it was. But can you imagine being a shepherd that day and getting that good news and all of a sudden the veil is literally peeled aside and you see the heavenly host shouting and worshiping and praising and singing. That's just something. That's a choir. That is a choir. i tell you what, that is going to be something. So that's a scene with the angels that I love. There's another scene that I really do love with the angels. Uh, there's a moment when Jesus references the angels when he's being crucified, that he could, or as he's being tried, that he could call on the angels and that God would send, he would, he would just send a squadron of angels to deliver him. He's not going to do that because God's will was for him to die. But the very fact that the angels, can you imagine how already they were throughout the whole crucifixion, how in horror they were as they saw the king of glory uh, treated such. Can you just imagine how they would have reacted had they been loosed? I think we get a little bit of a picture of it, and it's at the resurrection. At the resurrection, the angels appear to remove the stone. Now, the stone we know was not removed to let Jesus out. Now, we know that. We've, we've heard the stories. We've heard it every way. Jesus didn't need the stone removed to get out. The stone was removed so we could see. When the angels appeared, the guards just fell as dead men, and they just laid there. They, they were powerless. But I can just see the angel taking that stone, picking it up, and just slamming it to the ground, and then sitting on it. I think it was a glorious moment. I think, I think it was an exclamation point moment of the glory and the power and the majesty of the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. So we see that moment. We, we have these things happening, and we're excited about it. And, and this is an angelic activity that seems to happen. The, 
The shepherds see this. They marvel in it. And then I think they probably get caught up in just the moment because any of us would. And then they kind of come to their senses and they say, let's go see what they're talking about. So it says they made haste. And I was, I was sort of lamenting that. I thought, how many today? I mean, we just seem to be in such a day where we lack that zeal and we lack that urgency and we lack that commitment and we lack that wonder and we lack that conviction today to just come and run to see, to hear, and to learn about Jesus. That's what they were doing. That was their moment. That's, that's who they were. And so they were coming to worship the king. After witnessing the child, it says the shepherds made widely known the saying. What was the saying? It was just simply this, that there is a Savior that is born. Good news to all people. Folks, listen to me. I don't know how to convict convince to make us grasp onto something so important. But what we celebrate this time of the year is one of the greatest messages this world has ever heard. Unto us is born a Savior. He's Christ the Lord. I don't think, the only thing I think that could eclipse that is the words by the angel when he said, He is not here, he is risen. He is not here, he is risen. Now the shepherds went back to the fields that night, but they were changed. They were changed, forever changed. We are told that they told others what they had witnessed and what they had seen. Now I'm sure some people heard their story and thought they were crazy, religious fanatics, <laughs> but they knew what they had experienced and they knew who they had seen and they knew who he was. And nothing would ever change their story. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Folks, we have this treasure, this message this wonderful thing that this world needs so badly. May we, like the shepherds, learn the truth of the gospel. And may we be captivated by this child who now is, we know, the Lord Jesus, who is returning, that, that we would be willing to go and to tell and to share what we have seen and what we have heard. It says that as they went, they glorified and they praised God. Glorifying God means to acknowledge how great God is. It is to give him honor. He is, look, folks, when we recognize the glory of God, he doesn't, he doesn't need us to extend his glory or to improve his glory. He merely expects us to acknowledge it, to honor him and to praise him and to worship him to recognize his attributes, that God is holy, that God is faithful, that God is a God of mercy and grace and love and sovereignty and power. He knows everything. He's ever-present. He's completely powerful. Folks, over and over again, we can remind ourselves of how great God is. That's what it means to glorify and praise the Lord. So in the midst of this, look, I know, I know all the gift buying and I know the tree trimming and I know all that gets so crazy. But the message and what it's all about is God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. That's the gift, folks. That's the gift. Let's bow together. Father, I ask you in this moment that you would speak to our hearts so clearly that we would know it's you. Lord, if there's anyone here that's not saved, Lord, they know in their heart that you are Messiah. They know in their heart that you are the Lord. Lord, 
they know that you are the way to you, to God. And Lord, we come to you in believing and calling. We turn from a life and turn to the life. Lord, it's just a moment. It is that decision. It is an action whereby we put our faith and trust in you. And I pray today, Lord, if there's anyone here that has never done that, that even right now through these words, through the testimony of song, Lord, through the, the, the different ways that you've spoken in times past, that all of this would come to a moment whereby they might bow their head and call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. The Bible says, Lord, you said that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I ask that even right now. Lord, I pray for us as believers. We don't fear the second advent. Lord, I look at the seal judgments. I look at the trumpet and the bold wrath judgments with great trepidation. But I do believe we'll be with you through the most of that. God, I ask you to help us to be prepared and ready that we would help and share with others the hope that we have. I ask it all to your glory. I ask it to your praise. Lord, I pray that you might save the lost, that you might encourage the saved, bring revival and renewal in the midst of this wonderful season. And I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.